Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the technical glitch uh, to start us off. My name is Jason Buffington. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, so this is the second in a four-part series. We are talking about, or two, Veeam Innovation Award winners for 2023. So we have scoured the globe. Um, to find some of the coolest technologies that are out there. That process started in, gosh, November of last year. The awards were actually announced at Veeam On um, in May of 2023. And so let's go ahead and start the conversation by setting up a little bit of data. This actually comes from the Ransomware Trends 2023 report. Um, and if you're looking at that data, one of the things that you're going to see is one of the questions was asked, this was 1,200 organizations around the world. Speaking of around the world, please make sure that you're telling us where you're joining from. Um, we'll have the map up in just a minute. Uh, but uh, around the world who had at least one cyber attack um, in 2022, in fact, it encompassed actually nearly uh, 3,000 attacks from those 1,200 organizations over time. And when organizations were asked, on average, how long does it take? Right. And this first data point says it takes about 3.4 weeks from the time you start remediation. So that's not including triage, that's not including discovery, but from the time you actually first say, we've got a problem, we've got a plan, let's roll the plan, three and a half weeks. Now, some of that is because of the complexity involved and the serialness of, of recovering that data. One of the key ways that we often hear about how to shrink that time down is actually by involving partners. So let's go ahead and let me share with the folks at home. One of the data points that was also asked in the survey was who all did you involve? And in two out of five cases, the cyber victims did introduce a partner into that conversation. I can't think of a better partner to talk to this topic about uh, than uh, my esteemed friend, colleague and a partner, a chief strategy officer for 1111 Systems. Dante, thanks for joining the call. Jason, thanks for having me. So Dante, we're going to talk a lot about uh, about what it takes to actually prepare for and remediate after a cyber event. But can you go ahead and walk us through 1111? You, you are not the island that some people know you as from prior. Walk us through that, please. Sure. I mean, so, you know, 1111 Systems, we're a global provider of, of really providing managed infrastructure, right, for production, disaster recovery, um, you know, managed security services, as well as managed connectivity services. And if you, you know, look at what we've done, you know, we've, we've acquired a lot of companies in the last 18 months, um, but along those lines, right, we've stayed true to where we've been on delivering the best in class solution we can for the client based on their requirements, right? And I think what's really unique is, you know, a lot of folks today are really challenged trying to prepare for how they even attempt to recover from a cyber event. And that's where we have a lot of expertise. Okay, so let's. So you've also got a lot of logos, and I was asked to make sure we 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 laud all the logos that are there because one of the things that's unique about eleven eleven is you've grown through a series of acquisitions to offer a breadth of capabilities along that way, and you deliver those capabilities not just to customers directly, but also through your own um, ecosystem of partners as well. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. So we've we've always you know been a, a great channel partner, right? And just like Veeam, very focused on the channel. Um, and I think that when we look at our routes to market, there we have a lot of folks that will, you know, really look to embrace our platform because they're really considered a managed service provider, right? They're mm -hmm. looking to take our platform to market under their own brand, support their end customer, we support them. And we have we have a very large you know group of folks that are either recommending us into accounts um, or are actually you know our our mutual you know, value-added resellers, right? They're looking to bring the right solution to the client um, where they've owned those relationships for, for decades, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we're very, very focused on that globally. And I think Veeam, it's, it's been great that Veeam recognizes that and really took the opportunity to say, okay, let's dig a little bit deeper. We understand you say you're, a, you know, a player in the channel, but let's validate that, right? So it's nice to have, you know, Veeam's validation. And by the way, there's a couple things that, that aren't on there yet that'll be there very shortly. And that's really what we're doing on the Alliance side um, you know, making sure that we're Veeam ready from an object store perspective. So uh, before we get into uh, the, the breadth of solution, I am curious, did it surprise you on those stats of the three and a half weeks 
um, to recover? I mean, what are you seeing and feeling? Now, hopefully your customers are doing it in far better than three and a half weeks, but let's talk about the market overall. Boy, when you talk about cyber, I think those those numbers are actually seem kind of low, actually, right? Um, some of the some of the folks that we've talked to, it really just depends on how serious are people taking this on the on the front side. Are they truly preparing for it? Versus, yeah, I've got backup somewhere, or yeah, I've got a DR plan. I'm telling you, it is completely different to understand what you know cyber resiliency is all about. Forget about the preventative side, right? There's there's thousands and thousands of folks, us included, that are helping clients secure their infrastructure to avoid the event. Yep. But at the end of the day, you know, understanding what needs to happen post event, if if and when someone's compromised, so many folks just don't have the experience there. So that's what we're here to change. Well, and that's one of the things that one of the reasons why we've done the ransomware research report for the last two years is to try to get those lessons learned from people that have, you know, suffered through that. That research actually powers not just our go-to-market and, and some interesting narratives, but also helps us inform what do we need to build and what do we need to partner or enable the partnering so that uh, uh, folks like 1111 can build along the way. And it's also worth probably noting that the, uh, you know, that three and a half weeks, that's after triage, right? So, you know what, before we go there, let's tee up the map because I think there's a lot of folks that have, uh, um, that are experiencing parts of this. Um, we'd love to hear where you're from um, along that way. So uh, let's start off with um, in the US. Uh, so um, I hails from the great state of Texas, as does Dante. Um, uh, so a good excuse for barbecue should probably be in our short term future. Um, we also have production going on out of Ohio. I see New York has already weighed in. Um, we've also got production support coming out of uh, Georgia as well. So uh, the U.S. is representing this morning. If we take a look at where we're bouncing on the map next. OK, so my European geography is a little light, but I'm thinking that's Croatia. Um, along the way. So um, so thank you for joining. It's been a while since uh, since we've had Croatia on. So uh, please feel free to chime in. Uh, I always love when Brazil um, weighs in because a huge chunk of the earth just turns green at that point. And, uh, and uh, they're Colombian neighbors to the northwest. So thank you all as well. Uh, what do we got? So Ivory Coast and Tunisia joining on and India in that upper right hand corner. It always surprised me that India looks so much like Texas from an overall shape perspective. It, it's a, maybe a kindred spirit over there along the way. Again, no matter what platform that you're joining us from, please help us turn the world green um, and let us know where you're joining from. So Dante, you know, kind of thinking about that triage problem for a second, right? So you know, it's one thing uh, um, you've got you've got a data center down in Houston. You've got a big amount of presence, you know, from your 1111 heritage down there. I used to joke that you know, when Houston has a flood, you know which servers to fail over. They're the ones that are drippy, right? You know, so uh, if we have servers out in California, you know which servers to fail over. They're the crispy ones. Right. You don't know which servers to fail over um, when we're talking about cyber, um, uh, you know, because the the it's still got blinky lights on them. Right. So surely it's all clean along the way for that. Let, let's take a look at um, uh, one last piece as far as why this is so hard. One, you don't know what to fix. And then the other thing is um, we hear a lot of folks talk about the pressure that they get from their senior executives. We gotta get it up, we gotta get it going as fast as we can. And invariably, someone's gonna do something silly and actually reinfect the environment as part of the process. So I think there's both a technology problem here and a process problem. And those are both areas that 1111 uh, uh, thrives in. Can you walk us through what does it really take? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you look at this, first of all, you gotta understand what is critical to the business, right? And apologize for you know all the acronyms here, but but VDA, vital data assets, right? What are the most critical data assets? And it doesn't always you know properly align with your most you know valuable applications, by the way, especially when you put your you know cyber threat hat on and people are trying sure. to get deep and wide in the infrastructure, right? And, and hold you ransom for that data. Uh, but point is that first of all, you got you to identify it, right? And it, from that perspective. Veeam's got phenomenal opportunities for us to, you know, make sure that we have clean backups, which, you know, as you know, we can go through the testing process to, to yep. validate. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to understand how you test. What's the tabletop process to go through and understand how are we going to, you know, today we don't have access to this data. How are we going to survive? 
how's the business going to continue to run while we start to work on the restoration of the data and those applications associated with it, right? So that's one of those chaos monkey opportunities, right? To, to go through a whole bunch of different opportunities, understand like, how are we going to react? You know, what does the process look like? And I think also at the end of the day, you know, you just hit on a big point, like how do we guarantee that we're going to, you know, make sure that we do this in a proper fashion? And this is where we can add a lot of value, right? When you look at the, just the sheer volume of infrastructure, being able to go in and expedite that process of recovery is critical. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that, right? You have a lot of infrastructure where you can bring up multiple copies of the data simultaneously in completely isolated, clean room environments. That's- now I, know, I know that we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time and actually talk about the architecture. And I, I will tell you, months ago when um when the veeam innovation award process was first starting and you and you sent in this year's submission by the way speaking of this year it uh, um i i am compelled to say um 1111 systems um formerly known as island um or part of island is the only four time veeam innovation award winner um uh, that veeam has i mean you you continue to have new ways to help customers solve problems as this market has continued to evolve and the threat landscape has continued to mature so congratulations by the way on four times but i remember when i first saw your architecture diagram i sent it to our architects internally and i said I wish everybody did this. I mean, this makes so much sense along the way. But before we get into the the architecture side of things, let's talk about it from a strategy perspective. Um, let's go ahead and bring up that, you know, what's it necessary to be cyber ready? Uh, because it seems like there's not enough emphasis placed on organizational alignments and the strategy. One of the things I love about your approach, and in fact, you, you all acquired SunGuard. I mean, there's nobody better to coach through what does it take to actually be resilient than them? I've known them for years along the way. Can we talk about what does it actually mean to be cyber ready? Yep, absolutely. So I think the key here is to, is to also understand that there's a whole consulting process that overlays this, right? This is really just a component of what we call our managed recovery program. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about you know cyber, it really comes down to understanding, again, what is most critical in the business and what's the you know the plan to actually recover it and go through not just identifying that data but also coaching people on what the process is going to look like during an event and making sure that you're able to rinse and repeat that process because let's face it jason you know as well as i do change is the only constant right if right. you click this will build out a little bit on the bottom and it kind of lays out you, you mentioned clean it aligns very well with this slide right because once you get past identifying you know what's most important you've got to make sure you've got clean backups right you've got to make sure you have a recovery process that's well documented that everybody understands what their role is going to be but then that last bit there right understanding can we recover that on infrastructure um and again volume matters here right you talked about that average time frame of three and a half weeks you know, having the ability to to perform multiple point in time restorations and expedite that whole forensics process is where we can add a ton of value, right? And this actually kind of started you know years ago because we saw a lot of our DR customers were looking to contract for multiple copies of the data. Why? Yep. Because they were trying to mitigate against cyber threats, right? So we we ended up developing a whole program around it, but. I think if you look at the right hand side, understanding what the life cycle is here is and knowing that change is the only constant that you have to be able to continually look at this like any other operational process. It's going to change and you're only as good as your last exercise. So we actually had a live question come in. I don't know which platform, um, but uh, Wakas asks, asks about cybersecurity, um, uh, how it works with Veeam to protect the, the layered storage. And we're going to talk about that, at least as part of your architecture. But I think one thing is actually not in our, our data slides for today. Um, from the lessons learned from those 1,200 victims of cyber uh, attacks from last year, over 70 <coughs> percent, excuse me, um, now leverage a cloud repository um, uh, as their immutable tier in order to make sure that they have survivable data along the way. Uh, 
Dante, this is something that um, you know, eleven eleven or Island pioneered years ago around making sure that there was at least one survivable copy along the way. Can we kind of talk through? Because you talk about that here in the idea of clean data, right? So you have something to survive from, and then ensuring that cleanliness permeates through. Anything you want to add from an eleven eleven perspective? And then uh, looks like the map has been lighting up, so we got to make sure to go check out where people are calling in from. Yeah, I think the key here, right, is, is making sure that we've got the ability to provide validation that those are our clean backups, right? Um, and also going through the testing process. Um, that is such a critical aspect, and this is an area where we see most organizations really do a poor job, right? So having the ability to go in there and, and automate that process to, to the fullest extent is, is really critical because it can save a ton of time and energy. But what we typically do, especially in cyber incident recovery, is we want to run full teams through the process multiple times a year, even though we can automate a lot of this. Because you got to get people used to the process so yep. they understand you know, how a real event is going to transpire. In fact, I actually think that was one of your prior year 1111 um, uh, VIA wins um, was around that orchestration and testing process, the ability to facilitate those. You've mentioned testing a few times now. You talked about tabletops earlier. Certainly, you know, I've been a big fan of that as a traditional BCDR guy. If you don't test it, I promise it's not going to work um, when you need it most. You also talked about having those teams come together from a wide range, which is my not so veiled uh, suggestion of let's go ahead and take a look at the map and see where all those teams uh, might be coming from. Uh, so if we bring the map up, let's see. So uh, if we look in the U.S., looks like uh, the U.S. on the south is lighting up. Maybe that's probably because we're all about to face some fires over the next several weeks. So uh, disaster is a good topic to cover. So we're covering uh, uh, my uh, my dear neighbors to the south in Mexico. We see uh, Arizona's weighing in, California's weighing in. So um, thank you all for that. Um, let's uh, Let's take a look at what's over in the old country. So we got Poland weighing in along the way. Uh, let's see if we kind of pan south. What do we got? Looks like, ah, South Africa. Love, uh, so some of the best food. Dante, if you have not gone uh, to Cape Town, um, they they know as much about burned meat and good red wine as, uh, as our neighbors in Texas do. So uh, between South Africa and Brazil and Texas, some of the best eating around the world. And they're all three green today. So yay for that. Um, and we also got Indonesia, looks like Saudi Arabia, is that Pakistan? Um, and then also Sri Lanka, I haven't seen them in a while. So uh, so thank you uh, very much um, for piling on. Continue to let us through as well. Um, Alexander also brings up a question on um, what are the top three threats? So there's two ways to answer that question from the data. And then Dante, you're talking to CIOs every day. So weigh in on this as well. The data will tell you that um, that cyber actually this year for the first time from our DPR report um, was the most common threat. It's always in the top three, um, but, um, but hard drives still fail, right? So still having server infrastructure fail, still a very common um, uh, cause of outage. Um, and then um, we see a combination of infrastructure outage and unavailability of cloud resources tying at number three in this year's report, which I think is interesting because as you embrace hybrid, you know, all of a sudden an infrastructure outage, the cloud may be working fine, but if you can't reach it, you're just as down, right, along that way. Dante, when, when you're talking with leaders around what are they trying to achieve, what are they trying to protect against? Great question, by the way, Alexander. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if we shift the conversation from what you just mentioned, right, the, the typical, you know, reasons for an outage, right? When we go from, yep. it used to be, you know, the things that grabbed the attention were natural disaster, right? Human error, cyber, 10 years ago, right? Yep. And, and the most prevalent, it kind of like in that in that order, you can think about the amount of time it takes to recover, right? It's, it's kind of like an inverse relationship because cyber was the thing that was growing very rapidly over the last 10 years and steadily it's come, it's become more and more costly to recover from a cyber event and obviously take much longer versus, you know, when you look at a regional natural disaster, if you've got a, a solid DR plan, you should be able yep. to recover, not a problem, yep. right? Human error was probably the most common as far as outages are concerned. But if we shift the conversation to cyber, right? I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I was I was on a flight coming back, I think from California. Person sitting next to me was in the IT space. We were chatting. He was a pen tester, 
So I'm like, oh, he's got to have some amazing stories, right? So he was literally on his way to try to break in, physically get into one of his client's facilities. And um, I just asked him, I'm like, you know, what's the the quickest way you've gotten in? And if, you know, you've ever watched any shows on this, there's there's all sorts of, you know, great things out there. But he gave me a great example. I won't name the name of the software company, but there was a security software company um, that was in a very, I would say, well-known hack probably five years ago, right? Okay. So he was trying, he, he started to call into, he had a global client. He started to call into their help desk, but he was calling in internationally. So he caught somebody early in the morning in Ireland and posed as a salesperson for that security company, knowing full well that somebody in IT probably knows that company, right? And the person's like, look, not interested, blah, 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 blah. And he's, he's like, look, I get it. He said, but if, just help me out. Tell me who you guys use. And I'll notate the account. Otherwise, there's 50 people behind me. They're just going to keep calling. And, and this person IT was like, okay, great. We use XYZ, right? So he took that little nugget of the security company that they used. Then he started to call into marketing people. Sorry for all my people in marketing, right? But he, he called a marketing director in North America. Same thing. Called early in the morning. Person answered the phone. He posed as somebody that was working for this global cybersecurity company said I'm, right. on the, I'm on the global you know team there's been a, a breach we've narrowed it down to your machine you need to log into this website right now drop everything you're doing boom he was on the network two phone calls so the insider threat or social engineering right is clearly the, the biggest challenge we're seeing there is uh, um uh and we are so far uh, or I'm about to take us off topic. There's some fantastic YouTube videos around social media um, uh, phishing uh, out there in order to in order to get um, little bits of information. One of my favorites, if you'll uh, search for like um, uh, girlfriend baby crying um, uh, uh, phishing, um, there's a fantastic video where um, uh, one of the news channels had someone come in and how quickly they're able to get an amazing amount of information for um, for identity theft along the way. Um, Okay, so and we could we could talk more about that, but there's a few other things that are that come across. Um, also, want to give a shout out to uh, Javier. Um, so uh, enjoying the experience of doing business in extremely unstable conditions. You know, I've been in the data protection business now for 34 years, right? You know, it is the only thing I've done even since before getting out of college. Uh, and the reason is is because you're always going to have data that you rely on. The platforms change. Right. But you will always rely on your data and backups, while they're not always sexy, are always relevant. Um, and uh, um, the, the fun part is, you know, every time there's like a major crisis, people get excited about data protection for like six months and then they forget that whole cyber crisis thing. It ain't going away. People aren't forgetting. And so while it is an unstable time, at least we finally have executives that are paying attention when we say, you know, you probably ought to do more backups than you think. Um, which is kind of a fun time along the way. So um, also got a question around, is it possible to access stats, graphs, and charts? Yes, actually, um, I will have a QR code for you on the very last slide, and you can download the full report along the way. Um, and uh, by the way, Dante, um, uh, your solution is so interesting. If we want to throw a QR code or some other URL um, in the chats as well, so folks can find out about, because once they see this architecture, they're going to be a little jealous along the way, which is probably a good transition to go look at your architecture. Um, this was one of the coolest things that I've seen, and it's a, it's a long build. So kind of walk me through when you talk folks through this kind of challenge in the survival data and getting ready to restore, right? We're going to assume you're going to be unsuccessful in, in, in blocking the attack, right? The cyber event has happened. What is it, what's necessary before and after to actually deliver a survivable outcome? Yep. So I think when you you know, have this build out a little bit, right, you've got all sorts of ways that you can accomplish this. Some would argue this is three, two, one, one, right? Zero. So you could even argue if, if you took the entire, you know, design and implemented yep. the whole thing with us, it, you could almost argue three, two, two, one, zero, right? All right. So let's build it out. Where can we go? All right. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at now this day and age, right? We're going to look at some type of object storage, whether that's our platform, pick your favorite hyperscaler. The build out's gonna show AWS, right? Having a mutable copy in S3. Um, you know, from there, if you follow Veeam's architecture for 
um, Cloud Connect backup, right? Making sure that we've got another copy of that data. The difference here is we can also, you know, push that out to tape to get a, a physical air gap, right? So you're going from disk to tape. And then from there, you can actually, you know, vault that tape into an offsite facility. Um, so as you let keep, me, go let ahead. Me pile on for this part, because there, there's three capabilities here that I think most organizations think are mutually exclusive. And I love the fact that 1111's approach is complementary and not exclusive to each one of those. I love the fact that you've got to copy up an S3. And of course, our data is self describing, right? So, so the fact that you have a wholly survivable copy, that the only thing that's there is, is a storage credential, right? As long as that is a separate credential from the rest of the environment, you have survival data. I love the fact, love the fact, please, if you're multitasking, write this down. Cloud and tape are not mutually exclusive. I love the fact that 1111's design recognizes the fact that there is a place for tape. Um, now, in fact, one of the things that I love about this scenario is usually when people complain about tape, they're either thinking about tape from 20 years ago or they're thinking about the manpower problems with tape. One, the technology has changed. Nothing is the same in IT as it was 20 years ago. And secondly, the manpower is 1111 manpower. It's not your manpower. So you've solved the only two conceivable objections to not still having tape as part of your math. I love the fact these are complementary to each other. Sorry, just your your solution excites me. So I apologize for interrupting. Let's uh, let's keep going. Oh, it's all good. So obviously, as you know, right, you can push that out to a facility. All this stuff has to be encrypted, as we know, right? But the key here is that that last stack that's us providing the, the infrastructure yep. uh, to be able to recover all this, right? Um, but as you keep building, you're going to see all the other steps that you, you know obviously would want to be part of this. But I think the key here is to understand that we are going to bring up multiple copies of that data in a completely segregated clean room environment for each copy. Why so is that important? Of, oh, I this, love this. Right. So, so the the key here is we know that most of the companies we work with, they're gonna have some type of cyber liability insurance policy, right? And that's assuming they've done a good job of working with us on the managed security stuff on the front end, right, to qualify for that policy. But it's getting harder and harder to get these policies. So you gotta to attest to all these different processes and controls to get the policy written and hopefully affect your, you know, your rating and, and your your policy, excuse me, your, your rates. <laughs> Can't talk, right? More, moral of the story is when you do that, Nine times out of 10, that carrier is also going to provide you with a digital forensics organization. So God forbid you are compromised. They're going to bring them in host event to help go through the entire forensics process. Now, that's a bit of a double edged sword, Jason, you know, as well as I do, right? Because they're there to help their client. But at the same time, if they find through that investigation that you did not do what you attested to to get the policy in the first place, they're not going to pay out the policy. Right. So two things that kind of come out of this one, um, you know, if you go back to that first slide, we talked about all the different folks that are part of that remediation effort. Some of them are there to figure out how quickly to get you up and running again. Some of them are there to protect the dollars. Right. So where the insurers come in and forensics is part of that. You did mention something almost in passing that I think a lot of folks underestimate. And that is, is that if you don't have enough infrastructure behind the scenes to remediate, you're going to remediate one copy figure out it's also infected. Nope, got to roll back further. And then you remediate another copy. Oh, nope, that one's infected too. Got to roll back further. There is a huge amount of value and really what's going to save you more time in the recovery process if you can spin up multiple iterations at once. So you can just say door number one, door number two. Okay, hey, we have a winner on door number three roll forward with that. That requires a huge amount of dynamic infrastructure. It also requires an amount of orchestration that frankly, without orchestration, that's a lot of manual tasks and manual always means a protracted recovery time. Can I get an amen? Amen, brother. <laughs> so, all right, look, there's a lot more we should talk about. And frankly, probably should have done this as an hour long webinar as opposed to um, a 30 minute live stream. So maybe uh, maybe the, the fun folks at home, um, I saw a note from uh, uh, Jen Witt on uh, Veeam and 1111 Unstoppable Combo. See some chatter on a couple happy folks that are using 1111 that you've, uh, that you've rescued evidently over the years. So we should probably do a longer version of this um, along the way, but unfortunately we're at time for now. I do wanna also make a pitch um, 
Um, uh, so Tech Bytes on Thursday this week. Uh, my dear friend and esteemed colleague, Corinne Bissett, is going to be doing a preview of the first annual Community Hackathon. So you're going to want to make sure to look at that. Um, also, as promised, we can bring up the slides one more time, take a look at the QR code, uh, and you can get all the data and slides that we've talked about from today from the from the Veeam side of things. Uh, just to kind of wrap up, Dante, any famous last words? What's the, if you had 30 seconds with a CIO, what's the one thing you got to make sure they hear? They absolutely have to take stock of where they're exposed and get help. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. We run into this all the time. And, and you're, the last point that you made, Jason, is the critical one. People are ill-prepared for the challenge, typically. And even if they have some process, they don't have the infrastructure to really take that three and a half week average and compress it down to days. Well said, well said. 11-11, um, Dante, thank you for being a great partner. Congratulations on the VIA. Thanks for joining us today. For everyone else, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you same bat time next week. Take care. Thanks, j -Bo.